try scoring Wallaby champion, rugby's first true professional, the Australian wing three quarter who played 15 magnificent years at the highest level, 101 test matches, scoring a world record 64 test tries, player of the 1991 World Cup won by Australia. Campbell was the master of deceptive running, the free running back who brought the goose step to the game of rugby and made it unforgettable. The man with the great goose step actually, and uh, you know, he's, oh, he's done so much for rugby itself. David Campesi was an entertainer on the world stage. He drew people to the game, and whether he was playing in New Zealand, Great Britain, South Africa, Italy, France, or back home in Australia, the flashing winger had the crowd on its feet whenever he touched the ball. Campo was a character that made people come along and watch. And David scored some incredible tries. His vision and seizing the moment to strike had no equal. Sensational! He was also the perfect support player with the uncanny ability of helping his teammates get over the try line. He was always at the epicenter, uh, Campisi, of our great triumphs. Because Campo chanced his arm, took risks and played at the very edge, sometimes things went wrong, but he was always entertaining the crowd and the commentators. He threw the ball to him. I don't believe it. Rugby was always an adventure for Campo, an opportunity to show off his skill, express himself and just enjoy playing. But then David Campesi did not just play the game, he took it to a new level of excellence. He played rugby as it should have been for 15 years. 15 years. Throughout his career, Campo was in the media, always ready to speak his mind, and just coincidentally keeping his name on everyone's lips. Players, officials and enthusiasts of the running game everywhere all have something to say about Campo. Be it an incident, an experience, or a highlight. That was one thing that I remember about him. Um, introducing me to uh, Kalua and milk, which he drinks, which I still think is a, a woman's drink there. But when it came to sevens rugby, David Campesi was in a class of his own. Eleven appearances at Hong Kong between 1983 and 1997 stamped him as one of the world's greatest sevens players. Here he goes. He's through. They won't catch him. If Campo is not playing for Australia, they've got a big problem. Australia doesn't have any player like Campo. At club level, Campo ruled supreme. Between 1982 and 1996, he didn't play in a losing grand final team. Oh, Brilliant stuff! They call him the Wizard of Oz. I, I once said that Every time Campo touches the ball, the speed of the game changes. Whether it was for the Queen Bee and Whites, the famous Sydney club Randwick, or the two Italian sides, Pedraca and Milan. On the field, he had the instinct to be at the right place at the right time. He was a predator who preyed on the ball bouncing his way. Nobody has his skill or that uncanny sense of genius of just making that break and splitting the opposition. David Ian Campesi is a celebration of his talent, his early days and family, his artistry on the field, his global involvement in the game, his impact on teammates and opponents, and the definitive story from the man himself. Campesi! Countryside around Montecchio Precolchino, just down the road from Venice and Verona. A township of northern Italy and home of Antonio Campesi. In 1952, Antonio emigrated to Australia and settled in the New South Wales rural town of Queenbeen. Population around 24,000 and close to the nation's capital, Canberra. Six years later, he wed local girl Joan Murphy, and this house in Atkinson Street became home. On the 21st of October, David Ian Campesi was born, one of four children. The locals then wouldn't have dreamed of David's spectacular future in the game of rugby union. It was, it was basically a rugby league town. 
Growing up, David was always playing sport, at school and at home. We used to play cricket on the roads, uh, football, a lot of smash windows and everything like that. I mean, that, that was one good thing about growing up in those times where you can actually have the road to yourself and there's not many cars around. David attended Queen Bean Primary School and one of the teachers, Peter Ellis, who's still at the school, remembers Campo wasn't too keen on schoolwork. Well, he wasn't actually the class, let's put it that way, but uh, oh, no, no, he, he, he was a good kid. Uh, yeah, he got up to a bit of mischief, as most kids do, but uh, oh, no, he's no problem. But um, he just enjoyed his sport. Very good in the sporting field. Loved to be out playing sport. I coached him in a, foot, in a rugby league football team. He uh, didn't like to pass the ball, but uh, and once he got it, he knew where he was headed, of the try line. And uh, yeah, he was good. He was good. There was another reason for David's outstanding sporting skill at such an early age. In those days, having an Italian name was downright dangerous. I, get, I think it got into a few fights because I, I guess 20 odd years ago we had the, um, you know, the Wogs and the, and the Dagos and you know, things have changed, thank goodness, but uh, in those days I guess he got a bit of stick, he was Italian uh, background. I used to get built up at school by Aboriginals and things like that and that was part of growing up. Many an afternoon, the play got personal with David's neighbours, the Griffins and the Fitzgeralds, dishing it out to their Italian friend, the one who always seemed to have the ball. Fear and survival created a special sidestep for David, a change of pace that later became known as the goose step, Campo's trademark. Yeah, and I think I'd avoid the, the neighbour kids too, because I mean, say they used to, you know. Darryl and them. Oh, yeah. They used to get into you, didn't they? Yes, when so they you played. have to learn how to run around here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when those kids, you know, they used to always be round, or there was a vacant block next door, they'd get out there with their football and that, and it'd be really a bit serious, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they'd tackle one another and start hurting one another, and David would chop up home to mummy and daddy. I think when you um, when you do have bigger guys chasing you, obviously the quicker you are, the better. It wasn't long before the goose step was seen on the rugby pitch. I think I was about eight or nine years old, and uh, we went down there, played for the Queen Blues, and the best pies in the world were down there. Yes, so I used to love going down there. But uh, one day I just got the ball, I made a run, I said two guys run towards me, I stepped or did something, and I scored underneath the post. I walked back, and these two guys had collided and I think that's when the goose step started. The very next year, then age nine, David was playing rugby on a Saturday and word quickly spread about his uncanny ability. A journalist from the Queen Bee and Age, Barry Gilman, went along to see Campo play. Well, it was as the day I went out there and didn't expect a great deal, but I heard that young Campuzzi was showing, you know, sort of a bit of natural talent. So I went out and watched this game and I was impressed, you know, that, but once every decade, you know, so along comes a player that's got a natural ability to take the ball, run with the ball, show a bit of confidence, even arrogance at that stage, if you like. You know, he's a cut above the, the average uh, rugby player. And I was, I was very impressed with what I saw and I predicted in the column that I'd written at the time for the uh, Queenian age that this boy uh, has got everything. And uh, in the column itself, I actually said that uh, uh, he'd be one of the rugby greats within the next decade. That was in 1972, and then 10 years later, almost to the, uh, the day, he turned out for Australia to play at Lancaster Park against the All Blacks. Apart from the goose step, Campo had also developed genuine pace. As to its origin, Father Antonio has a theory. It's B. No spaghetti. Oh my goodness, mate. <laughs> from Dad. I remember squashing the grapes in the back there. <laughs> I used to train very hard. I used to do uh, road racing on bikes, uh, racing around velodromes. Um, I was I was basically involved with everything sport. I mean, I was I was it. 24-hour sport I could do, I would do it. And uh, cricket, everything. I just loved playing sport. And um, and then eventually you um, I used to you know run little little athletics. Used to swim, but I was very competitive. I used to try and go on everything because I loved it. Teens, David mostly played rugby league, that is, until after the under-16 grand final. 
progress sort of informed and, and the coach was sort of blamed me for my tackling and I went away really distressed and then I played golf for a while and then one day I went over to watch fourth grade play and after the game I said to the coach, do you need a fullback? And he said yes, and next week I started. That team was the Queen Bay and Whites who played in the Canberra competition. And it wasn't long before the dashing young fullback called David Campesi was being hailed a sensation. His reputation as a kid became so big in the Queen Bay and Canberra area that I remember, you know, sort of Cole Maxwell, his coach, standing on the sideline and the team came out to play. And we got up against Darren Marlin College, a Catholic school in Canberra. The Darren Marlin coach warned his team, watch Campuzzi, watch Campuzzi, watch Campuzzi. We watched him so closely, the rest of the boys went on and scored, took out the game and went home winners. <laughs> yeah, everyone knew that Campo had it. I mean, all our moves are built around David. Uh, he was playing fullback in those days and every move was built around Campuzzi. And I guess, why wouldn't you do it? I mean, uh, he created so much, uh, so much space for everyone else and, and they just... I mean, he scored some brilliant tries in those early days. With Campo at the back, the Queen Bee and Whites dominated the competition, winning three consecutive premierships, 1981, 82 and 1983. Walton gets it back into Campisi. Campisi puts the kick up. And he gathers and scores! Oh. What a magnificent try! Where would you go to see a try like that? Yeah, this was in the 1983 grand final where uh, Campuzzi put him in 129-12 uh, and all the points in this game were scored by David Campuzzi. Um, he, again, he's, he scored some brilliant tries that day. And that's the try that Quimian wanted. Barry onto stumbles, cutting out. Murray, Maguire on the kick ahead. It's a good kick too. Campuzzi coming through and Campuzzi's got a catch and he'll score and he does. And he scores the try. David Campesi was being compared to dual international Michael O'Connor. Uh, the 19-year-old star is the hottest property to come out of the Canberra competition since Test Centre Michael O'Connor. Look, we were so lucky in Queen. I mean, we saw him before the rest of the world. We saw him do things, what I call the unfettered Campo. He did things that you just didn't see. People just go, huh? Did that happen? Did that happen? And sidestep, swerve, change of pace, goose step, chip and chase, chip and recover things that no one else in the world has seen because when we saw him no one had put any harnesses on him Berry stumbles number 8 David Maxwell Campisi, Campisi oh and he's over, he's been paid that try he went over in the corner Campisi run easy, score try easy July the 10th, 1982, one of the most important dates in Australian rugby history. The scene is the Sydney Cricket Ground, and the Australian under-21 side are playing the New Zealand Colts in a curtain raiser to the Australia-Scotland test. David Campesi is Australia's fullback. Michael Liner, Australia's fly-half, with Grant Fox, his New Zealand counterpart. July the 10th, 1982, is the day David Campesi caused a buzz around the ground around the world. Campo was just a magician with the ball. I don't have specific recollections of incidents in the game, but I do recall there were a number of players, and he was one of them who caused us a lot of trouble that afternoon, and we got beaten 36-12, um, which I think is the biggest hiding I've ever had by an Australian side. But, um, you know, he, he was a fairly useful player. Yes, and a little bit too much cover coming across to there. Three players had him covered. Liner's there, brilliantly taken, he's a chance for the Australians, Gerben. And I have subsequently met tens of thousands of people who reckon they were there that day because it was the most astonishing performance of any player I think I've ever seen in my life. And uh, I was behind the goalposts in the uh, Bradman stand at the Sydney Cricket Ground and I have this vivid memory of, of um, all black players lying out like uh, as if they'd been shot and, and Campo sort of stepping through them like a Salem uh, racer. It's, it's something which I, I've always remember. And uh, we went away from that game and I went home and I told, I had a young kid there and I said, I've just seen a player, I can't believe how good he is. He's just a phenomenal player, David Campisi. Parappa. 
pass to Campisi. He's gone straight through. He has Hanley outside, and why did he kick? He's backing his pace. Will he score? I think he will. Sensational try. How good is this man? I can't recall that I knew of Campisi, but I must have been there for a reason, because Terry Curley and I both went to watch some of these kids, and there weren't many people taking any notice, I have to say. And, of course, that's where I saw this unbelievable try. He has Ross Hanley outside, chip ahead, and look at the pace. Too quick for Kieran Crowley, and that is a magnificent Australian try. Just go out there and enjoy it. I mean, we were pretty confident as a young team. We had a lot of good players, and that was the future of Australian rugby coming through that year, and um, that's when we all got selected for the Wallabies. But just going out there to play, I mean, if you, you just go and enjoy it, and there's not many people there to watch the curtain raiser, so it's just go out there and have a good time. Lovely work by Campisi. He's going beautifully. The pass went behind. Play on, says the referee, McDonald, And it's a try. David Maxwell. Well, the day after, we went to uh, TG Milner to watch uh, Eastwood play Ranrick, I think it was. And I was with uh, Glenn or Gary Ella, and they announced the Wallaby squad, and I was there. So I was quite happy. But Campo only made the Wallaby touring side after an extraordinary meeting on the morning the side was announced. Ten Queensland players withdrew support for coach Bob Dwyer and refused to tour. And I was strenuously supportive of Bob Dwyer because he was the Australian coach and I thought that if he wanted certain people to go to New Zealand he should be allowed to have them. And I knew that he wanted Mark Eller basically as captain and it was there that the business of Ella being captain began and in the light of everything that's subsequently been said about me and Mark Ella most of which 99.9% .9 of which is incorrect that was where I supported in the presence of Dick Marks and David Clark and oddly enough Tony Whitlam don't know what he was doing at the thing at the luncheon supported uh, Mark Ella for captaincy and Campisi to go in the side to make the Australian side because I was the person that had seen him the day before. This was Sunday morning. If not for this extraordinary circumstance, David Campesi may not have had the opportunity to excite the rugby world in 1982. What a great try. That was a great try. They want to keep the score pretty close. The 1982 Bledisloe Cup Series and coach Bob Dwyer selected 19-year-old David Campesi for the first test against New Zealand. In the lead-up to, uh, to the first test, a couple of the senior guys were, were chatting to, uh, to me about the team selection. and uh, I can't remember, I think it might have been Duncan Hall, but, but one of the senior guys said to me, uh, I think you should pick the young bloke. And, uh, um, and we did, and he marked Stu Wilson. It's pretty legendary that he, his first test was at um, in Christchurch at uh, can't remember the name of the ground, uh, Lancaster Park, and he marked Stu Wilson. It was pretty much a legend. Leading into the the test on the 14th of August 1982, Dave Campisi in the Wallaby camp was asked, you know, how did he feel marking the hardcore veteran uh, All Black Test winger Stewie Wilson? And Dave Campisi said, Stu who? That was my first impression, that was the very first thing I ever read in a newspaper about David Campisi, an upstart, brash little Australian. So I thought, OK, Saturday afternoon, Lancaster Park in Christchurch, I'll probably dish it up to him. Unfortunately, that never happened. Dave Campisi in that test scored his first uh, try for the Wallabies. Uh, it was his first test match, I marked him. He zapped around me a few times, uh, I saw the, uh, the back of his jersey more often than the front of it. Mark Eller. Kicking across for Campisi. Campisi must score. Yes, that's a try. And the first time Campo got the ball, he was one on one with Stuart Wilson and he stood him up in, in, in and away and, and stood him up and uh, thought, well, it takes a special amount of um, confidence in your ability to, to really have a crack at someone. You, you think maybe you're a little bit nervous in your first test and you'd ease your way into it, but he didn't. And that's pretty much been the hallmark of his game. He's, he's never wanted to ease his way into anything. It's give it your best shot. Now the test in Wellington uh, a couple of weeks later. Yes, David Campisi scored again and looked pretty damn smart. Australia arrive in numbers. He's a chance for Ella to Gould. Now they have an overlap. Hawker. Now it's Peter Grigg. 
Peter Grigg going inside Loveridge. Back to Mark Eller. Gary Eller. Lucas to the line. Can he get it out? It's a try to Steve Williams. It's Campisi. That's a great try. Australia further ahead. What a magnificent test match try. And the second in the test match for 19 year old David Campisi. Well, I didn't really know much about Stu because coming from Queanbeyan, I don't think uh, rugby was very big, so I didn't know about these players. I wasn't uh, trying to be smart, I just didn't know about them. And, um, and to, to, her, to know about Stu and playing against him, obviously I learned a lot more very quickly, but uh, going into the game, they just said, you know, to me, you got 15 All Blacks playing 15 Wallabies. They're all dangerous as far as I, can, as I was concerned. you just got to go and watch, there and watch every one of them. To Campisi. Campisi is over. Now it's a try. Gary Eller has scored. Yep. Gary Eller, his first try in a test match. And a great work there by the Australian, particularly David Campisi, the 19-year-old. And Australia ahead 10-0. They have an overlap. Bernie Fraser. Mark Eller in defence. Campisi. David Campisi, off he goes. There's Watch Bernie the Fraser, and there's the tackle of Mark Yellow. What a great tackle it was. And there's David Campisi now with his Muhammad Ali double shuffle, thank you. Audacious play from the teenager. But the goose have never been seen in, in 100 years of world rugby at all. And here's this um, youngster, um, probably only just started shaving, um, who, who brought this cheekiness on a rugby field that I guess, you know, rugby's a had been, and, and still is to a large degree, a pretty conservative sort of game, but he was a guy who um, expressed himself um, in a manner that we, we, we were unaccustomed to in the rugby world. And in the third test, uh, the one that this, the Wallabies did beat the All Blacks in Eden Park, I uh, went for a drop goal, which was unheard of, um, but basically Campisi had to ruin my confidence. So I thought I'd take a snap drop goal halfway through the first half, which he gathered um, under the goal post. And uh, when he finished running uh, 40, 50 metres down the end of the track, the Australians actually scored, but the try was disallowed. Um, that was the difference between David Campisi and Stu Wilson in the 1982 series between the All Blacks and the Wallabies. He was very, very good for a kid. Wilson, drop goal. No good. Campisi! Campisi's away! Up towards halfway, he's still going! A breakout for Australia! Slack! Still going, but the referee says a forward pass. Steve Williams galloping away. What a tragedy. The Eller brothers, Mark, Gary and Glenn, were famous for their run-the-ball attitude, their instinctive communication and support play, and simply their genius on the field. All things Camper could relate to. He immediately struck up a, a rapport with the Eller brothers. I suppose he, he thought, well, these guys really want to run with the ball in hand. Um, I'm with them. And then I came across the Ellers, and my first memory of the Ellers was, I think it was 1980, Leslie Cup game where Mark was playing 5'8", and he passed his ball around the opposition player, and I said, that's pretty good. What do you say back here? I made, him look as, made him look good. In 1983, against Argentina, they combined beautifully. The Sydney crowd witnessed the goose step for the first Campisi. time. David Campisi! Goose step! Yes! Yeah, I think because we actually played the game differently than a lot of other players, and we ran the ball, and you had Bob DeWey, who's a coach who wanted to run the ball, and you had Alan Jones, who also wanted to run the ball. So we, uh, we had a, a generation where everybody was had different ideas, and we had the players who wanted to take the chances, and we were them. The same year against the United States, Mark helped David score a record equaling four test tries in the one match. That equals the world record. He's been probably one of the highest profiles the rugby players the sport has ever had, and uh, you know, I enjoyed playing with him because he wanted to attack and, and wanted to have a bit of fun, and uh, I don't think he's ever lost it. Campisi again, stepping brilliantly past Hartman, a lovely step off his left foot. Here's Andy Slack with Moon outside, what a try this will be! Slack for the line, and it's Australia's fourth try! In 1984, Australia had a new coach in Alan Jones and embarked on the Grand Slam Tour of Great Britain. 
The players wanted to run the ball, and the coach agreed. Will one at the front. Campisi, straight through. Look at him go! Poyman, Matthew Burks outside. Against England, Mark Ellis scored the first of his four Grand Slam tries. Australia won, and David Campisi came head to head with Rory Underwood for the first time. A clash that would continue for a decade. Hands, Campisi, David Campisi. Underwood chasing. Poyman. Try. Unpredictable. You know, he can do anything. Uh, you think he might go left, he might go right, he might chip at the top of you. He might just run his way and pass the ball. I mean, that was the thing about Campo, which was so good. He was unpredictable. The Welsh Test saw the Wallabies dominate again, and Campo proving how elusive he is. Campisi! Point of it! Line up! Try! You can't program him, and that's why he's such a great player. That nothing that he does is physically programmed, but to perhaps to a large extent, it's deep-seated, subconsciously, mentally programmed, somewhere, somewhere in there. And um, as he said to me after one game, uh, I, I, I don't know where I'm going. I just go where my legs go. Against Ireland, David turned them inside out for Mark Eller to score yet again. Mark Eller, what a try! It was enjoyable, we had a lot of fun, and, and particularly in, in a lot of those games, the Scottish game and the Barbarian game, I always make the joke that I probably got the ball, or Campo and I probably passed the ball each other more than, than I did with, with Coxie at halfback or, or Nick Far jones I mean, and that was the way we liked to play it, because we ran off each other, and I guess we anticipated, anticipated each other's movements so well that we were always working together, and it was good fun. Australia wrapped up the Grand Slam, beating Scotland. Overlap for Campisi. Mark Eller, he's done it! A try in every test match! The first time in history! Mark Eller, the toast of Australia! The, the three tests before that, England, Ireland and uh, Wales, I didn't score a try. And the funny thing was, Andrew Slack said at the hotel before the Scotland game, he said, I think you've you got, I've got a feeling you're going to score two tries today. And I scored two tries. Great play by Robertson. Milne's there. Peter Grigg intercepts. Mark Eller. Off they go. Campisi. Kleinman. Campisi. Can he get there? Beatty chasing. They won't catch him. Another Australian try. A record score against Scotland. What a passage of play. We actually worked on the move where Andrews, Roger Gore took it up. Uh, Andrew Slack, Slack got it and uh, he actually threw a pass about 15 metres onto me on the wing. And the interesting thing was Slack, he wasn't a very good passer. He's and a he actually passer of a long ball. Yeah. And he used Derek to practice Australia. after the Clonethley game. He was outside in the rain passing the ball against the wall. And therefore when the try came in the Scotland test, so it was great because he actually practiced where he wasn't very good. Cool. Almost got Oh yes, Slack! Campisi! He's over! So uh, a lot of the tries that uh, we, we scored because we basically wanted to run the ball and we backed up each other and I think that's that's how the tour sort of uh, eventuated for running rugby because the guys just wanted to have a go. In 1986, Australia played a three-test Bledisloe Cup series against the All Blacks in New Zealand. Campisi! Australia. My first real uh, impressions of Campo was uh, seeing him play for Australia and uh, when he was young. And uh, I thought then, what a free spirit. And um, the great thing about Campo is nothing changed. What I saw initially is what I saw when he's when he's still playing. Uh, that spirit and that freedom and that ability to express himself as not many other footballers have had the ability to do so. Now they go again. Papworth, Campisi. He's inflicted a lot of damage on us over the years, um, along with some other players. But um, you know, he's had this wonderful um, ability to turn um, nothing into something, 
Um, um, he also made the odd cock up too. Jerry right to tackle. Long pass, dangerous. Joe Stanley for the line. Joe Stanley, great tackle from Cowden. Well, it came from a suicidal pass. The stadium has erupted. New Zealand is suddenly right back in this game. Oh yeah, well I just didn't listen to the coach. That's probably why. I still don't listen to the coach. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean that's one of those things you got to try things and it didn't work. Camper is the sort of guy who can make you cry, can, can make you laugh, can thrill you, can exasperate you, and that's just before half time. You know, <laughs> he's the sort of guy that that you know it was fantastic to play alongside. He was usually worth two tries to the opposition, but he'd give you three or four. Brewer, two from the back, taken by Cutler, great take. He slips the ball back to the Australians. Liner to Pepworth, here's Burke, Lyon, Pepworth! Brett Pepworth, must be a try if he can pick it up, Leeds. He's going for the line, he's there! In his first test! Well, a mixed reception. In this series, the All Blacks appointed winger John Kerwin, a tall and strong running outside back, to Mark Campbell. The New Zealand winger felt apprehensive before the match. I guess fear was the first thing that uh, came to mind because having to mark him was always a uh, you know, pretty awesome uh, task. So, yeah, fear, I think. David was on hand to score the winning try in the third game, running inside Kerwin. Australia won the series 2-1. to one. Australia has won the cup. A first for the Wallabies in New Zealand. is overjoyed. Look at the elation in the Australian team. Campisi hasn't seen the ball today, but that makes it all worthwhile. Well, any time you beat the All Blacks, it's like heaven. <laughs> you know, all that hard work that's gone into uh, to beat one team. And there's no greater reward, I think, than actually see the All Blacks when you see you up in the scoreboard Australia beating New Zealand. In 1988, David had a new Italian job, playing rugby for Milan. His skill and pace again helped Milan to win two championships, including the 1991 Italian club crown. I said to Milan the first thing was ice. You know, went and bought a machine. Uh, about looking after each other, uh, injury-wise, basically being letting these guys know that you just don't turn up and train. Basically, I'm, I was here to win, and um, I will do whatever I can to win, and hopefully it rubbed off, rubbed off in the Italians. In 1991, with Mark Eller coaching, David scored a sensational try to win the Italian championship for Milan. Yeah, for tournament, because I've seen a lot of players in non ordinary, and I've said to Fabio Diego Dominguez, pass the Polony because no sono, and molto fortuna, I've fatto tanto lavoro ultimo mese in corso. Sandro Manzoni, who presented David with his 100th Test Award prior to the test in Padova, believes there is no greater rugby player than Campo. Campese is the right player to play rugby. I consider Campese the best player in the world, eh? if we consider in the right way the rugby. And even in a friendly game of tip with the team, Campo shows his eye for the gap and ability to beat a man. It's obviously uh, obvious now uh, for me where, where Campo gets it all from. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's obviously from his uh, Italian heritage in five seasons here. You know, he's, he's, he's picked up a lot of the Italian ways. They play very much on, on, their, uh, on their instincts and uh, you know, the first couple of matches I'd sort of wait in the middle of the field and, and let them do their stuff and see where they ended up and then, uh, and then get there. Campo's good friends are two brothers who play with Milan. Massimo and Marcello Cotito. He taught a lot of, uh, of technique to the players and uh, well, personally I learned a lot from him, from his play. So, but, so I tried to get the, the best part of his play because if you get all the, the worst part then it would be a big problem. Campo's contribution to Italian rugby has seen their national side defeat France in 1997. Ah, I think that David's got a lot of Italian in him. That's why he was uh, so unpredictable. And, we still unpredictable, you know, because Italians are not very stereotyped. They always have to do something different. They have to show that they're different, and that's why probably David is like that. He's got Italian blood in him. 
Basta, 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 dai, basta, basta. Buoni, buoni. Grazie. Yes, he was the match winner. He's, he's, uh, he brought a new mentality to to the Italian uh, Italian um, players. I mean, uh, all the Italian players actually take an exo- take example from David. He brought this kind of um, you know of, of thinking to all all the players in the team. And uh, if you go and see at the moment, all the players are really you know really, really training more than what they used to train when uh, you know when, when David came on. Uh, to Milan, so people are starting to train in gym, and they they're taking things more professional. And I think, uh, you know, thanks to David, that brought this new mentality. Nineteen eighty eight and the All Blacks toured Australia for a Bledisloe Cup series. David Campese's opposite number, John Cohen, was out for revenge. Like I was worried about JK because he, he was playing very well then too. So I think that um, it's a bit of uh, a bit of both, you know, you look after make sure that you stop him and he's got to try and stop you. Yeah, and I guess I learned a few things off camp. I mean I used to hate people on the football field, that's why I used to have to play, you know, I used to have to give myself up to those sorts of heights just to be competitive and um, I guess Campo always you know was always uh, ready to have a smile and say hello and that sort of stuff he wasn't sort of the aggressor Grant Fox cut out now to Stanley and here's Kerwin he's through and it's another New Zealand try straight through the tackles of the Australian men out wide including Campisi round one to Kerwin the double cut out, missed by Leeds and badly missed by David Campisi. Just straight, hard running try, John Kerwin. David never recovered from that missed tackle. Campo's confidence down, John Kerwin run riot in all three tests. He's around him, Campo won't get him. Kerwin, he's got into touch. He's got into touch. But here Kerwin beats Campisi, all ends up. Kerwin. This time, and gets another five metres in field. A successful Grand Fox conversion would put New Zealand in the lead. I remember the, the whole series actually. In fact, uh, people often ask me what you know, which was my favourite tour and that sort of stuff. And I think Aussie '88 would have to be one of my highlights because I felt that I was on top of my game and things went well for me. And obviously, I was marking David and uh, and um, you know things went well for me that series. But he certainly got me back. Jones straight through. While a bloodied Wayne Buck Shelford held aloft the Bledisloe Cup, David Campesi was fighting his own demons. Self-doubt and a hatred for losing played on Campo's mind. Whether or not his mother saw these pictures, she mailed David a copy of a poem she'd read in the Queen Bean Age called Winners Take Chances, written by an unknown American poet, Nancy Sims. Yeah, my mother sent this poem, Winners Take Chances. She saw it in the paper and she realised I wasn't uh, feeling the best and sent it up to me and I and, uh, found it to be very inspirational. First of all, he has the courage to be true to himself. He goes after uh, what he wants and um, he does it his own way. And I think uh, it takes courage to do that. Just what it actually means, what it says. Winners take chances like everyone else they fear failing. Yeah, you know, I think it's in, it makes it interesting too because um, from what I've read about David um, and heard, um, I think most people like myself may be surprised that he would sit somewhere and read a poem, you know, because he seems you know so tough and stuff. He's not going to see this, is he? <laughs> but um, anyway, yeah, it's you know to 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 know to know that, yeah, it's great. When we change, steady yourself to make the tackle. The return kick doesn't matter, but the tackle does matter. David was inspired by Winners Take Chances. Before every test match since, he has quietly read these words. Yeah, 
Yeah, 88 was uh, very memorable because it was, um, I was probably a player that had been there a long time. There's a lot of new guys in the team. Um, and I think from 84, there was probably Nick Farr Jones, there's probably about five or six players. The rest were all new guys. So in the backs, I'd been there before, I'd done it, I'd got this reputation of being this sort of player. And I just went there and I enjoyed myself. And I think that's why I played good rugby. I think in 1988, he was phenomenal. Maybe his best tour was 91 because of considering the standard of the opposition and the importance of the occasion. But in 88, he was freakish. For the first half of this tour, when we weren't playing all that super well, he carried us. Now, I've never known a situation where a winger carries a team before, but he did. He carried us. David, when he came to this country, he wanted to, like all great players, show off. You know, I, I can do this. And he wanted to prove to people that he could run and sidestep and move and flick balls here and there. He wanted to be a star. And you say to yourself, why does he want to be a star? And I've always thought it is probably, his name represents to me some sort of Europe, Campesi, Italian. And, you know, with Gallic improvisation, he could show you on the field something the game longs for, that difference. And it's the essential difference in this play that made him, for me, sort of streets ahead of all the other players who I watched. At Twickenham, the home of rugby, the car parks tell a story about the game. There on match days and behind the gates and bronzed rugby heroes, it is also home to many memories of David Campesi. The British loved to cheer the Wallaby number 11 wing. In the Museum of Rugby at Twickenham, and alongside some of the legends of the game, is Australia's representative, David Campesi. On the visual display computer is rare footage of Campo's wonderful tour of England and Scotland in 1988. These are midweek fixtures which often never got exposure, but it didn't matter. Campo played them just like test matches, always putting Australia on the front foot. One teammate who just months before had shared Campo's disappointment against the All Blacks, hooker Tom Lawton, was very excited about Campo's play on that tour. On one of the tours he was uh, player of the series and that, I think that was the 88 tour of England and uh, and he was just outstanding in every game that he played I think. Uh, I mean guys like Campo I think their contribution to rugby will be probably fully understood a long time after he's finally retired and I, uh, it was a privilege to play with him and I think uh, most Australians would feel the same way, he's a, he's a magnificent Sportsman. Back to Twickenham in 1988, and Campo showed his defence was back on track, while arch rival Rory Underwood had a red letter day scoring two tries which excited his mum and contributed to England's well deserved victory over the Australians. I got a couple of tries here at Twickenham that day, and he managed to get one. But uh, you know, I felt as if I was starting to get with the team. You know, with England having such a, as a very difficult start in the 80s, uh, towards the end of the 80s and 90s, when England started playing some good rugby, that we started to be able to take the team on as well as have a chance to take on Campo. Despite this, that tour re-established David's reputation as the world's premier winger, and by now, Campo was much loved across Britain. Well, he's, 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 he's a living legend over here as well. The players in Australia. Apart from the fact he's probably one of the best wingers I've ever seen at Twickenham, uh, he still was the excitement into the game, um, and he's a he's a match winner. Very inspiring. You know, you watch him and you just feel you like you like to do exactly what he's doing. One thing Camp had never forgotten were the fans. He played for them, and he always seemed to have time, no matter where he was in the world. Sorry, <laughs> Bill. In just about every team picture you can see here on the walls of the Australian Rugby Union headquarters is one David Campesi. For 15 years, David has been part of the Wallabies, travelling and entertaining the world. We have a saying in the Wallabies that uh, rugby touring is a bit like sex in that 
when it's great, it is fantastic. And when it's bad, uh, it's still pretty good. And, you know, David and I shared a lot of good times, uh, not just on the field. Of course, we had our moments, we had our successes, we had our, you know, really interesting things on the field where we just enjoyed each other's company and things clicked. But it's the touring, it's the off the field stuff. Mind you, I mean, five, six weeks normally saw me out. Uh, Campo just loved touring. I mean, he, he once said to me at the end of a tour in 88, we'd been on a uh, tour of England and Scotland and we're sitting in a spa tub uh, recovering together. Um, we'd missed training this particular day. Uh, it was right at the end of the tour and he said, Nick, isn't it sad the tour's coming to the ed- end? Wouldn't you just love life to be like one long rugby tour? And I think I realised then we had a lot of things in common, but we're also very different people. Here in Paris, what better place for Camper to be than at the Paris Opera Theatre, the place where the legend of the Phantom lived. Like the Phantom, David tends to live in private and only really shows himself when he's playing to the crowd. London has always been a favourite place for Campo. He's known there and invited to all the right places. Rugby's been, I think, basically all his life. You know, he's, he's toured that many countries. He knows people in all countries and he's got many friends around the world. And I think, yeah, he just feels comfortable. And, and, and especially in the Northern Hemisphere, they love him up there. You know, Campo's been given um, quite a hard time in, on, on occasions by the Australian media. And uh, But up in the Northern Hemisphere, they, they love him and, you know, rightly so. The question begs, what is David Campesi like to room with on tour? A couple of things that stick in the, mi- in the mind. Um, he very rarely wears clothes in the room. He, uh, he's constantly walking around naked, which, uh, which for some people may be a good thing, but <laughs> I can remember, as I said, he's, he's, he's a character. He's, the phone never stopped ringing. Rings when we're, we're in, in a room with Campo. He, uh, you basically become his personal secretary for the, the stay in the hotel. Obviously, the Wallaby tours have been fantastic. I think it was about 14. I think I missed one. And it's great to see a different country, you know, go and play rugby, different styles of rugby, um, and going away and being successful as an Australian and, and you know, representing the country. I think that David Campisi is seen by New Zealanders as a New Zealander as much as he is an Australian. There is no Australian rugby player that is revered as much as David Campisi. Uh, He has a special place here. Uh, New Zealanders love him. Whenever you see David Campesi in the dressing room after a match, chances are he'll be wearing very few clothes, which brings into question his image as a sex symbol. I think that some women just think he's fantastic. Not that I don't, but um, I just, no, I don't see him like that, but I know that a lot of women do. Thinks all the ladies love him, but I don't know that. I think only his mother loves him. I don't think he's got many girlfriends at all, you know? And when he goes overseas, I think he thinks that he's got a ballerina in tow or something like that, but I think he's just telling stories. So he's just an average bloke like you and I with the girls. <laughs> uh, one of his characteristics was that uh, he never had the same girl. I'd say <laughs> he was always with a different girl, so, which is good for him. <laughs> I don't think he'll be happy about this one. <laughs> Barbarian Rugby, the century-old club in Britain, has a proud history. An invitational team, the Barbarians play with unashamed abandon. It is free-running rugby at its best. Some of the greatest games of all time have featured the Barbarians up against the visiting touring teams. Goes back inside to Slack. Slack's looking for support. Up come the forwards. Pilecki goes on. And Slack takes it. This is going to be a magnificent try for Steve Williams. These games are made for Campo. It's Campo Unleashed, it's Campo in full song, and it's here that Campo endeared himself even more to the British rugby-loving public. Campesi, listen, I'm not a rugby man, you know. I, I go to a lot of rugby, I love rugby. I don't really understand the game. What I do understand, I think, are people. Campisi is one of the really great people who's ever played sport. I mean, just the way he comes from the field, it's the way he behaves himself, it's the way he doesn't give a stuff about authority, it's the way he gets on with it. I really love him, and I go to, I've been to him, I've seen him maybe a dozen times in my life. I think he's absolutely marvellous. Mickey Steele Bodger, the proud leader of Barbarian Rugby, knows the contribution Campo has made to his club and the running game. 
Uh, he is so unusual, I think that, I mean, Lomo's current fellow, if you like, now is quite different because that's just bullocking strength and a bit of pace. But Campo has a, just a magic. And uh, I think that because it's been known as magic for so long, it encouraged him to try even more magic. And occasionally he makes a mistake and he's caught out, but mostly it's tremendous fun. Mark Jones. Yeah. Walker on the dummy run, Camp Basie is clean through for his first try, and Cardiff marks far, and he's overjoyed. World famous Welsh rugby scrum half Gareth Edwards, the scorer of that most celebrated barbarian try in 1973, is an emphatic Campo fan. It's often difficult to describe David Campesi. I think he was a magician of kind of sorts. Uh, I mean, there's been often many, many ways to describe him, in so much as he's an enigma, maybe, and all kinds of things. But I think, by and large, he's been an entertainer. Now, I had the satisfaction of watching him uh, as a commentator for over a number of years, and in particular, it was the '84 tour, the Grand Slam tour, when they came to Great Britain. Uh, where he was quite outstanding. In the 1984 Australia Barbarians match, David Campesi thrilled everyone with his exquisite display of pace and swerve. And there's a story to this run. We'd thrashed Wales, and the reception was at the Angel Hotel. I've walked in with Michael and Campo, Michael Arnold and Campo, and the first person we see is this chap Ackerman, who'd played against us that day. And so we were courteous, and I said hello. And I said, uh, bad luck today. I mean, you've got to say something. And he said, uh, I, don't, I didn't think your backs were very good. And I said, I beg your pardon. And Campo and uh, Michael were there. And of course, they apparently were used to all this. I wasn't. So we then played the Barbarians. And one such play was, as I recall, originated, I suppose, about 50 or 60 yards from our own line. And uh, Campisi's got the ball, and suddenly, who is it? It's Ackerman. And I'm certain, I've never discussed it with him, and I'm certain he remembered the Angel Hotel. So he could have run past him, he could have passed him, he didn't. And so Campisi just turned this Ackerman inside out. For 30, 40 metres, it was humiliating, and the crowd starts to laugh. That was wizardry, wizardry all the way. Then, in 1988, Campo created the try of his career with an unbelievable 50-metre run to the line, a run that had everything. Far Jones, Lloyd Walker, on to Cook, Campesi, Campesi, the change of pace again, the dummy and clear. Oh, what another just mesmeric try, a dazzling score to finish it off. I was a standoff, so really I shouldn't have been there because I was covering. <laughs> So, looking back, maybe I shouldn't have got there, but, uh, you know, I, I don't get beat very often, but, uh, you know, he, he sliced up one way, then the other, and scored another post. It was a brilliant try, and unfortunately, he's shown quite a bit on television, and, and I'm the defender. <laughs> the whole of Cardiff Arms Park rises to this genius. And the whole crowd rose to him, and he's walking back. The team, as well, uh, clapped and rose and uh, applauded him, which I've never seen on a rugby field. Afterwards, we interviewed him in a telephone box, but uh, that's the only place we could get a bit of privacy. The most intriguing thing of that thing was following Campo after that, that try back to the team hotel, which was around the corner. And even though the distance from the dressing room to the, the front steps of this hotel was about 100 yards, it took him about two hours to get there because there was thousands of people who wanted his autograph and thousands of people, people who wanted to watch him. It was like the, watching the Pied Pied with thousands of these little mice following him. So we just sort of walked inch by inch as he, as he shook everyone's hand. And there you knew that you know, this this man is a superstar and I don't think a lot of people in Australia realise the how, how much he's idolised in Europe, in, particularly in, in England. They, they just love Campo. Cheers, thank you. That's, sorry, sorry, no more. Sorry, that's it, that's it. Cheers, thank you. The 1991 World Cup was held in Britain, Ireland and France and David Campesi hits top form early on against Argentina. 
you know, we've had some good good victories with him, and uh, I mean, if it, it's certainly better to play with him than against him, I must say. And uh, he was uh, always, some, whenever he got the ball, something happened. The quarter-final against Ireland at Lansdowne Road, Dublin, and Camper was at his brilliant best. With Nick Farr Jones injured, Michael Liner was captain when Ireland came back and got to a three point lead with just minutes to play. And Michael just said, Guys, we've got to get down there and score. And that was it. I called a move that brought Campo back close to the forwards. Campo, who is normally when he comes near forwards, uh, he wants to be a bit like me. He wants to get out there, out of there as quickly as possible. But he must have been listening because uh, he went into, got tackled, and Simon Poitevin came and hit to rip on him. And uh, Campo stayed in the ruck and hang, hung onto the ball. And because he did that, um, and Simon drove on him and drove forward, we got the ball attacking put into the scrum. And uh, I stayed there because I could. I felt that someone was one of the Irish guys were trying to steal the ball and I had to stay in there. And the funny thing was I was knackered. Luckily we, we got over. Australia fighting for their World Cup lives. I wouldn't like the one of the job yet. Alright. Campisi, little was held on the ball, Campisi. Light up! Yes! We got it! It was one of Campo's better passes. I think it was about two inches off the ground, but <laughs> and the ball popped up from Noddy who, like every 5-8, should support, and he did a great job and scored in the corner. I turned it off when they scored that try at Ireland. I thought, that's it, they can't come back. And all of a sudden, I just thought, oh, well, I'll just put it on to see what happens. And I'd missed it, and they'd won. I thought, no way could they come back, you know, Australia. The World Cup semi-final was against New Zealand in Dublin. Millions of Australians tuned in in the early hours of the morning to witness the ultimate David Campese performance. They have a bigger, stronger pack too. Well, I was on the angle and um, I had three All Blacks sort of in front of me and I just picked JK and I just ran on the angle. Well, the biggest mistake I made is I turned the wrong way. Um, I should have turned into him and I turned out. And of course, once you do that to David Campisi, he just stepped. So I turned that one, I had to look over my shoulder. As soon as I looked there, he stepped there. I turned back the other way and he was gone. It was just a classic turning someone inside out. Um, what I should have done is turned, faced him going that way but uh, I was worried about the guy on the outside and he just made me look like a fool, which is, you know, how good he was. That's how good he was. So that was, uh, he, he was he was great that day. Yeah, and that was almost the match, really, and then that, that back pass into Hora um, was another, you know, those two special moments sort of created the win for him. They need to get the ball back from here. it comes. Back in 91 when uh, we had played, won the World Cup, he was a player that I tried to follow a little bit whenever he got the ball on the wing, I tried to follow him as much as I could and, and it seemed to uh, seem to pay off. He threw that pass without even looking but it's something that somebody like Tim makes very easy to do. It's wonderful skill that Campo showed but Tim uh, is one of the great talkers on the field and if you watch the video of it you can see Tim's mouth going away calling for the ball. So. Even though Campo was running sort of round in S's and all sorts of things, bamboozling the New Zealand defence, he knew exactly where Tim was because of Tim's good work in calling and he, Campo just threw one of those miraculous passes that we practice at training. I saw Campo had the ball and I just went straight for him, trying to nail him. I thought I had him covered, but I remember looking up, Australia scored a try, so he obviously got the pass away somehow. The thing is that um, you, you just play, I mean you know the instincts are there, you know if you pass a ball someone's there or you can see out of the corner of your eye the opportunities arise and you do it, you don't think about it. You can't coach those things and uh, Bob Dwyer 
um, whatever he says about him, you know, we'll have been very pleased that he was on the field that day and it got into the final. And, uh, you know, I think he was part of the Australian um, psychology in the final where England tried to play football and if they'd have played 10-man uh, rugby, they might have beat Australia that day. But, uh, you know, he, the World Cup will be remembered for um, as the David Campisi World Cup. The 1991 World Cup final. And early on, David could have won the game right here, but for one bounce of the ball that was cruel. Willie O and the Australian forwards then turn pressure into points. Australia very close here. In the second stanza, Australia defended as England tried to win with ball in hand. When we won the 91 World Cup, the most pleasing thing for me, I mean, you know, the, the actual winning aside was to come back to Australia and four months later to see how the registrations in junior rugby was up sort of 300%. And, and when I look back, that is the thing that gave me most pleasure. Largely the reason was because the young kids were sitting up, you know, at 1, 2 a.m. in the morning, watching this fella Campisi and, and dreaming that they would like to do the same thing. Very hard, very hard to, uh, to explain. It's just something unbelievable. Over the years, David Campesi has never shirked telling the media how he feels about anything to do with rugby. Without doubt, he has been good copy for journalists around the world. Whenever the word Campo is mentioned, or oh, I'm saying I'm going to do a story on Campese, you can either guarantee you're going to have something on the front page or something on the back page. Well, like just last Saturday night, that my sports editor just said, give us more of Campo. Everyone loves Campo. And as simple as that. For a journalist, he's a meal ticket. The, the key is that the journalists say to each other, when you're stuck for a grab, go and talk to Campo because he'll give you the truth. <laughs> One of the best players ever. He's one of these guys who speaks his mind and people don't like that because he speaks his mind. But as far as I'm concerned, with him, black is black, white is white. He doesn't mince his words. And he said to me, that isn't quite the way I meant it. He said, sometimes things don't come out the, the way I do mean it. I said, I know, I sometimes think there's a faulty connection between your brain and your mouth. He said, I think you're right. Nobody's in the news, nobody's talking like this. Like the tennis, when McEnroe and Connors played, everybody used to hate it, but when they left, they say, oh, well, who else is going to do it? We want them back. And at the moment, no one's going to say anything because of professionalism rules. They've sort of uh, been told, you can say this, you can't say that. I mean, there's no freedom of speech. One minute he'll say one thing, one minute he'll say the next. But he says what he thinks, and he always has. Sometimes it hurts people's feelings, but that's camper. That's what they like about him. He's good copy. Sometimes it's a bit stupid and dumb, but at the end of the day, there's more sense and more validity in it. It's just reading the paper this morning. He's still, he's still featuring in the headlines. <laughs> it never holds back. The tour after the World Cup, we went to Ireland, and uh, I'd just done a little bit of goalkeeping practice on the Friday prior to the first test against Ireland. I came off the field, I was captain, and I came off the field, and all of a sudden the press went boom. I said, what did you think of what Campo said? And I went, oh no, what's he said now? And he said, well, I just happened to have a tape of what he said. And he said, well, the Irish have been drunk since last year's World Cup. They think they did well against us and they've been celebrating ever since. And I went, oh goodness, here we go. <laughs> so I sort of said, well, Campo's entitled to his opinion. It's not necessarily the opinion of the rest of the team, but you can be sure every Irish player that night had the clipping of what Campo said about them on the wall and on the wall beside their bed. And, of course, out they came in the first 20 minutes and full of fire and brimstone. Thanks, Camper. These guys, I mean, with problem at home, we've got three coaches who are probably egotistic maniacs. They've got to realise that um, it gets to the stage now where, OK, I know that they want to be Australian coach, but this is Australia. And, you know, the guys playing for Australia, it's a great honour, as you know, and I've been doing it 15 years, and that's why I still like to play, because it's the ultimate. And I think these guys have got to realise that when something's on with Australia, they've got to let the top players go. We've got to have pride, pride in our nation.
Three test Bledisloe Cup series held in 1992 in Australia epitomized the ferocity, the pace, and the skill that makes these test matches between Australia and New Zealand so magical. It's probably the best test series in the Northern Bledisloe Cup. Yeah. There has been much written and said about Bledisloe Cup rugby. None more stirring than by former Australian Wallaby and coach Dave Brockoff. There's nothing in the world like playing the All Blacks. They're the hardest men. They're the best footballers, they're the fairest footballers, they know the laws backwards, their fitness, there's no boxer in the world fitter than the 80 minutes of pace, power, precision and skill. You've got to be above yourself in committing yourself to a level of pain, pride, pressure. In the first test in Sydney, David Campesi was following Nick Farr Jones and he was there to plunder as Ian Jones mishandled. Campus defence was stretched to the limit by Tui Gamala. Tui Gamala! Every time I got on New Zealand, there was this big, fast, new, young winger, and I tell you, I had to find them all. Yeah, there was uh, John Curlin, Tui Gamala, Jonah Lomu, um, you know, you got the Rushes, you got uh, Osborne, you got Wilson. I mean, they're all being great players. New Zealand then turned on the power with an 80 metre effort featuring John Kerwin and finished off by Frank Bunce. And I love playing Australia, love playing Australia and especially over there because right through my career the Australians were always, you know, the best or it was, you know, us two teams and uh, the competition was fierce and it was great, really good and that series was no different. The game hung in the balance. Suddenly Campo decided he had to do something radical challenged the All Blacks' pack, and he almost succeeded. Bar Jones, ball, ball, spoil, it comes out, Campisi, Campisi! Held up, great play by the Australian wing three-quarter, they've got numbers, Warren, try! David Campisi, you have beauty. Australia home by a point, but amid the mayhem, a wonderful moment between Warriors. It was after that first test in 92. The final whistle went and we were, oh, I think I was just outside our 22, and I just went down on my haunches. I was gutted, and um, and I just, I couldn't be bothered moving. I was really gutted, and I remember Campo coming up to me and, you know, saying, you know, thanks, mate. Are you OK? I sort of said, what, well, you think I am, Campo? <laughs> He would just lost, and I'm meant to be okay. <laughs> the second test at Ballymore and the Wallabies laid on a great team try, while the New Zealander Richard Lowe became enemy number one. Jake the middle! Carossa, try! Fantastic try! Carossa, he just loves getting to those corners. He's got speed, he's got power. After, the, after he scored the try, Richard Lowe isn't going to get there without doing something. Watch this. Comes in and here. Oh, right and he's shot up his elbow. New Zealand looked home. Then a turnover and the player who'd endured Richard Lowe's indiscretion got revenge. New Zealand under pressure. Australian ball. Numbers. Wider. Carota. Yes. What a try. A marvellous Bledisloe Cup victory to the Australians. The Wallabies' World Cup form was proven. Oh, the relief, look at it. The hug for Tempo and Bud and Jake Howard, the whole unit have worked together. This means so much to Australia. New Zealand, we come off the World Cup. Uh, we were obviously the favourites to win and New Zealand started to rebuild. And all of those players are still there today. So I think that that was again, like in 1990, we started to be, rebuild after the third test. And in 1992, New Zealand started to rebuild after the uh, Blues Lake Cup series in Australia. Yeah, just great moment there of Australian rugby. He's just a must. Eyes, hands, feet. Coordination, speed, skill. He does something priceless. He's the game breaker. He's the test match winner. He's the Blues Lake Cup winner. But the, the moments of his spirited skills, it's just been brilliant. I, I do remember missing him when he did that. Uh, 
it was one of it was a goose tip or, or something one of the skips he does and it like was you know, sort of clean uh, fresh air and uh, as as an open side flanker uh, you know I had to work in tangent especially if it was on if he it was a short side and you know with Nick Farr Jones and and company and broken play of course I mean you know I I, I must admit <laughs> I have a few memories of times when I, you know, I thought I had him, but I, in the end he wasn't there, so he was gone. From the moment David Campesi entered the international scene, Australia began to do well. But alongside him, in the Australian under-21s, back in 1982, was fly half Michael Liner. And on the 1984 Grand Slam Tour, Nick Farr Jones had joined the party. These three players had so much to do with Australia's rise in the 1980s and eventual World Cup glory in 1991. This was the on-field brains trust of the Wallabies. Campo, Nick Farr Jones and Michael Liner, they saw Australia through what many believe was the Wallabies' most successful era. Uh, you know, Mike uh, had about 11, 12 years, I had about 10 years in the Australian team and uh, Campo's only just finished after about 14 or 15. So I think that, um, you know, when you have that sort of longevity and consistency of selection, I mean, we're always there. Um, that sort of set, you know, tends to happen. I mean, it's nice that people talk about that, that, um, that we were sort of the core of the team and the heart of the team. I mean, the, the UK people used to call us the Holy Trinity, um, which is very flattering, I must say, um, because to be you know, held in the esteem of, uh, of, of the camp easies and the liners um, and, and to be the heart of the Australian team, it's a nice thought. But yeah, definitely we, we had a lot in common and um, we shared a lot of moments and a lot of minutes on the field together. Now it's Steve Tyneman. Campisi gets around Kerwin. Here they go, Australia. Nick Farr Jones, the try's on here. Campisi's there. Campisi! Great try! Yeah, I think we worked it out out of 64 tries. I think Nick would have been probably involved in about 46. And it was the combination. He knew what I wanted, I knew what he wanted. So I think combination like that are vital in Test Match Rugby. Because every time there's a call, he'd uh, acknowledge, or if he called, I'd acknowledge, and that's how it worked. Nick Farr Jones and myself had a good understanding, but part of that was Camper and knowing where he was going to be as well and running with him and him knowing what we were doing. And, I mean, there's been a number of times when uh, Nick has put the ball in front and Campo has been there. And just the understanding between the three of us was, was really quite astounding. And it's understandable with Nick and I because we're so close together, but Campo's a long way away. And often he'd pop up behind you and you'd just hear this, I'm on, I'm on your inside and you know exactly who it was and when he'd be there, etc. And uh, so it was, it was good to have that and somebody that, with that sort of vision and uh, uh, sort of sense of where the gap would be, made us look good a few times. <laughs> Favourite, favourite story about Campo is um, it, it was one on the um, the Wallaby tour to, to New Zealand 86 first test we're playing in the mud and they put a big high ball up to, uh, to Andrew, Andrew Leeds was a fullback that day and they worked out a training that, that, that Campo was going to drop back with Leedsy and sort of talk to him about the big high ball that was going anyway the high ball's gone up and Leedsy's under it Campo's dropped back beside him and Leedsy's going okay Campo have I got time have I got time talk to me talk to me Campo not a word and, and the All Blacks have got themselves out of that scrum and they're charging towards him and Campo and, and Leedsy said to him Campo have I got time can I catch can I kick what can I do and Campo said Lindsay, Jesus Christ it's going to be close 1989 the third and deciding test between Australia and the British Lions in Sydney the moment Campo made the decision to pass the ball now Campisi and Evans oh this is terrible stuff it's a try oh one of those things I mean I think if you look at the amount of ball I got in those tests I think I touched the ball three times if I don't touch the ball more than three times I'm, I try something if it doesn't work it won't work I get frustrated Terrible stuff. It's a try. I mean, that's one thing that's happened, and um, people can either say it was good or bad. It doesn't really bother me. Just really? change the subject and get on to something else. Throughout his career, David Campesi has been known as the entertainer of rugby. But behind his cavalier approach on the field, there's been a professional attitude to the game that is his life. At a time when players were perhaps not nearly as well prepared uh, physically as they are now. Camper was always perfectly well prepared. He would leave no stone unturned to be as strong and fit and as fast as he could possibly be. When we speak about professional, we don't speak about morning. We speak about uh, 
the right way to do sport. And Campese was the first uh, professional in the, in the world of rugby. He has worked at developing new skills. Gliding into the back line at first 5-8 has been a trademark. It has to be a try. And he hasn't been a slow coach either in making a living out of the game. He seems to be another world. You know, and he, and he was in another world. He goes to Italy, he knocks off money before any of the people here even thought about how to do it. He's very clever. He's wonderful. He's one of the great old-timers. And, you know, there aren't too many good. They're all um, soccer players. They're all trying to get 25 minutes. He just knocked off, you know, four or five minutes. And I'm really happy for him. I think he's a wonderful chap. David's professionalism also extends to life in the dressing room. Mate, he's the sort of man that'd be in the corner blow-drying his chest here. <laughs> he's, um, he's a good man. He's a good man to have on your side, Kev. In the dressing room, he, he likes to be relaxed, has a few laughs, he's cracking jokes. All the forwards are getting serious while uh, he and all the backs are cracking jokes, but um, that's, that's the way Campo is. So the first time I saw Campo getting changed, he took his number ones off and there was his Adidas singlet. He's sponsored by Adidas and he has been. I'm watching him and he's got his, takes his shoes and socks off and puts his Adidas thongs on around the change room. And I'm just sort of watching him out of the corner of my eye and I thought, nah, it can't happen. He wears Adidas underpants to the games. And I just thought, mate, I'm in awe of this character. This is phenomenal. Just a good friend and, uh, and, and hopefully we can have a few uh, Cokes Campo, Coca-Cola. So, <laughs> I know he likes his Pepsi um, over, over the next few years. But while Campbell has warmed the hearts of crowds everywhere with his play on the field, off the field he has tended to keep to himself. While very loyal to his close friends, he lets few people get too close. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure anyone ever <laughs> has ever got very close to him. Um, I mean, he's still a bachelor, so it's pretty clear no one's got very close to him. Um, I think he was quite happy in it with his own company. Um, he wasn't what I'd call a social animal at all. Um, he didn't, you know, I don't recall him, I mean, he, he, he didn't really drink, I, don't, I think he likes the odd glass of wine, but I've never seen him um, out on a rugby night out when you, you know, after midnight when you've got a few under the belt and you, you're slurring your words and can hardly walk. Never saw Campo in that environment. Oh, without doubt. I mean, uh, sometimes, you know, I, I underestimate how, how lonely you can be and uh, just over a few beers last night, um, you know, I, I, I again realised that uh, maybe I've erred because, uh, you know, I should have been calling him more often. I've been a long way from home, but uh, there's no doubt he's going to, you know, he's going to go to his rugby grave with, you know, you could count his good mates on a hand, and that's, that is disappointing, but it's the, the way David chooses to live his life, and, uh, you know, he is very much alone. At the same time, um, you know, he knows a lot of people, and, and he can communicate with them, but uh, when it comes to really close friendship, uh, as I said, one hand and uh, you can stop. In 1992, South Africa was reinstated to international rugby and Australia, then world champions, played a one-off test in Cape Town. It was also a special occasion for David Campesi. With the help of Tim Horan, Campus scored his 50th test try, a record. A chance, goes into the history book, the first man to score 50 tries in international rugby. He gives Campisi his moment of greatest glory. Super work, David Campisi, wizard of Oz. And uh, we beat South Africa in South Africa. Um, they said, you know, the signs were you aren't the real world champions until you played South Africa. We beat them, and they still didn't believe us. Um, and then in '93 they came to Australia. We we probably thought the first test that I'd try too hard. It was apparent in the first test David Campesi was the target. South Africans won the first test and proceedings moved to Brisbane. Australia were fired up. Plenty of talk, plenty of 
now the captain Kurtz goes forward. Clark Jones, the port of McKenzie. This is great stuff by the Wallabies. Clark Jones, fourth play. Corrin, play Luke. Little, Jason Little. The try is in death. This is one of the great tries scored at Ballymore by the Australian side. Look at them clean it out. Now Bowen. Rover. Little great break. Pardo. Campisi. Look at Horace coming. Yes! Timmy Horan, you great man, what a try. Campisi, great kick. Horan, a chase, a good bounce. A friend will square the series. Make way for Sydney for the retire. Test match was played at a furious pace. Again, the outcome was too close to call when suddenly the Wallabies got their face play into gear. And who should be there to seize the moment but David Campesi, who materialized in the center. Wonderful stuff. Campesi. Campo had turned yet another test Australia's way with a masterful incision into the back line. A stirring series victory for the Australians, and a great farewell to Nick Fard Jones on home soil. This test celebrated South Africa's return, and yet another Hail Mary pass from Campbell to Tim Horan. Yeah, it was a, uh, a big float. I'm not sure whether he meant to pass it to me or not, but he probably saw uh, a, a defence <laughs> defense coming at him, so I got a bit scared. But no, he, uh, he's obviously got great vision, and you know, for the amount of um, <clears throat> mistakes that he does make, he, uh, at least he has a go, and that's his whole motto, I think, is to, uh, you're not going to get anywhere unless you, uh, you try something. I think, obviously, they won the World Cup in 95, and um, I think it's great for rugby that they're back. I think that, uh, you know, they've been away for many, many years, and, like, you know, I mean, it's, it's probably unfortunate that we never got to play against the Danny Gerbers, the Ray Morts, and the Rob Lowe's, and all these guys, the Uli Schmidt when they were playing well in the early 86, 86 87 because of, because of the apartheid and the, the Rebels, New Zealand Cavaliers went across and they were great test matches and um, things really changed. I mean, they still are a force in rugby, they're the world's best. So, um, you know, we, I got to play with a couple of them in, um, in England, the World 15, they're great guys. I mean, they're just like everyone else. They love rugby, they love playing, they love travelling the world. And that's, that's one good thing about the opportunities that I have been given is to actually meet up with these people and play with them. Touring Australia in 1993 was Transvaal Lok Hannes Stryden, whose memories of Campbell go back to his youth. Great memories. I think um, myself as a, as a young child, I remember David Campisi playing and me going hysterical if he starts playing because he makes such a big difference to a side. He's, he's got an influence to change the whole game, the whole, the whole outcome of a game. And if he touches the ball, I mean, something happens. And you're sure that, that definitely something is going to come out of, of the ball that he's handling. After the Grand Slam tour, David went to play in Padova, northern Italy, representing the Petrarca Rugby Club. Petrarca won the 84 and 85 Italian club championships, with Campo showing his teammates how to run the ball. This is, uh, Campo, this is my jersey. Campo jersey. Campo jersey. Or anything. Campo jersey of that period. And, uh, well, and that is, uh, the the Petrarca jersey away. Normally we have the black jersey or the white jersey, and that is of uh, his last season for Petrarca. Within minutes of arriving back in Padova, northern Italy, David was driving a spider through the countryside he likes to call home. The Italians are very different people. They live uh, for the family. They um, love food, the fashion. Some of the women are fantastic. I've got relatives there. Um, I know a lot of people who live in Milan have never been to Venice, and people in Venice have never been to Milan. And I find it fascinating that I've got to come all the way from Australia, and I know all these places, and I've been there with some of Italians haven't. 
but I've got relatives there and I think it's just good to see how things haven't really changed that much. I mean the Italians are the same, my, my father was there and um, they go on about life and they enjoy it. Beside him sits his old coach and friend Vittorio Munari, the man who brought him to Petrarca back in 1984. Uh, I was in Australia in 1983. Uh, I think that there was a uh, dinner after the function after the United States test. And then uh, just uh, was, I was interested because Campese, his name is typically Italian, Campese. And I was just uh, so curious about uh, this boy. He was just starting for Australia two years from. So 84, he had the Grand Slam. And after that, he started here. We was training at that, at that time in a very muddy, uh, old uh, ground uh, with not too much light, uh, very freezing at night, but uh, he was uh, leading, his uh, temperament was, uh, was there from the beginning. Davidino, quanti ricordi Davidino, quanti ricordi Davidino. <laughs> yeah, Victoria's a great friend of mine and uh, we've had a great time, he used to coach and um, I used to abuse him, he used to abuse me but um, his knowledge of rugby is very, very good. For him, it's much more important to win. He like, of course, to play wide, uh, running game, definitely. But the more important things for him is to win. He's a, a very bad loser. That is why he's so committed, so uh, he gives 100% every time. Although David has not played for Petrarca since 1987, there are many close friends to call on, including Victorio's wife, Daniela, and then on to the beautiful villa owned by Giacomo and Antoniella Lorello. Giacomo and Victorio were both scrum halves and are known as Pixie and Dixie. Yeah, I didn't see him play, thank God. I probably wasn't born. But, um. From Giacomo. One woman and one teacher. And 120 bars. Viva! Viva! Viva Davidino, the king of the champions. Champions. Bravo. <laughs> Who is the star of this movie, me or you? You. <laughs> but another surprise awaited David, meeting up with his 1984 teammates for dinner. <laughs> this photo was the moment David walked down the tunnel for his 100th test match in Padova. In 1996. <laughs> now, going to dinner in this part of the world with 20 rugby players is different from a few pints at the local. Here it's wine, pasta, and conversation. Hey, Queen Lee, David, welcome home. Thank you. We'll always be much attached to him for what he meant for us. He was with us before becoming the star, of course, the best player in the world. And the next morning, Campo revisited the Oval, where he played his 100th test match, a venue that had been organized by his friend, Victorio. You could have had anywhere in the world at Twickenham and all these great ovals, but... You know, the way my career has gone and things like that, like part of it was, was probably a great place to have it. His 100th test brought a lot of attention to rugby in Italy. You know, I'm Italian. I want Italy win. But uh, I want Campo to perform well. I want, you know, it was an important moment. I know what was behind 100 test for him. It's a long story. I mean, it's, uh, it was a very, very unique moment. Beach one, beach two, beach three, beach four. Sensational stuff. 
Between 1987 and 1997, David Campesi played for the famous Ranwick Galloping Greens. And what a relationship. They were made for each other, with Ranwick's run-at-all-cost attitude and Campbell's genius. Snipes. Back to Arthur and a Campesi. With David Campesi running from everywhere, the Galloping Greens stormed to premierships in 1987, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 94 and 1996, dominating the New South Wales rugby competition. His professionalism and competitive spirit played an important role. Well, I look at club rugby like international rugby, I always try and play the same. I don't try and go and say, oh, it's just a club game, I'll just go out there and have a bit of fun, um, which I always do, but I don't try and treat it as just another game of rugby. I treat it like, OK, this is a rugby game, I'll try and put my best performance on. Go, 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 go. The camp easy. Camp. Camp easy. Brushes off one. What can you say about this man? At Randwick, there's an official who's got green blood. And that's former Wallaby Geoffrey Sale. Over the years, he's wondered seeing David Campetti in action. Oh, yeah, it's, a, it's different having a, an idol here, I guess. We've got lots of good people, but Campo is Campo. I think he's, you know, renowned throughout the world, and, and his attendance just here just electrifies things, you know, because of him, him being Campo. The 1992 Grand Final saw Gordon race to an almost unassailable lead. But they didn't count on Campo's majestic performance in the second half. Covers there. Campisi has come up with the try. Well, you could never keep this fellow out of the match. But, uh, just see those signs of tiredness and that feeling of deja vu. Oh, Campisi! Splendid stuff! They call him the Wizard of Oz. And it's for that very reason you will see his great vision, his wonderful pace. David Campisi, the hero of this grand final. In the 1994 grand final, David Campisi turned on the goose step and Randwick were on their way again. Oh, grand finals always have and I think that, um, I think I've mentioned that since 1982 I've never lost a grand final in any country I've played in. I've played in like in Queanbeyan, I've won in um, Sydney, in Italy. So my record's pretty good, but grand finals to me, uh, you waste the whole year if you get to the grand final and lose. I mean, it's a nothing year. And I think that the, uh, the realisation of losing the grand final is, is pretty despairing after spending so much time to get where you are and then sort of lose. With rugby enjoying a surge in popularity, the 1996 New South Wales Rugby Grand Final attracted a big crowd to the Sydney Football Stadium. And just after half-time, Campo got them on their feet. At the 1997 season launch, Run presented David Campesi with a framed photo of his classic 1992 grand final try. Campo is a, a great uh, ambassador for the game, a great ambassador for Ramy, probably the, one of the best footballers in the world. He, he works very hard, he trains three times a day and uh, you can only wish him well in what he does in life because he tries his hardest and rugby's been the forefront of his life. David Campesi played 56 matches for the New South Wales Waratahs. As time went on, it seemed he got better and better. Burke and Templo! He's brought the house down. 
With the innovation of Super 12 Rugby, Campo responded to the new rules encouraging running rugby. Oh, it was great. I just wanted to go out there and prove I'm 34, I'm still good enough to play. And that's basically what I did. Stay on! In their defence, they've lost a lot of players injured, but here go the Blues again. Tom's a good long pass to Burns and Burke steams into the gap. He's got Campo inside. Campo sets up for the post. Campo's is going to score. Um, it's pretty uh, either he's too old or I'm too young, one of the two. Um, we didn't, I didn't have more time playing with the uh, with the man. He uh, he's probably one of those footballers who just exemplifies just uh, the attitude of being able to do anything, and uh, and it shows on the football field. It's just fantastic. Campo's contribution to New South Wales culminated in a special tribute match in 1997 against Queensland. Masks were the order of the night, along with some campesian magic. But the one thing that David Campisi had that nobody else in Australian rugby has ever had is excitement, excitement plus. It didn't matter what David did, whether it was good or whether it was bad, when he finished his particular dash on the field, the juices were running, the adrenaline was pumping, and you knew you'd been at a rugby game, and you knew you'd seen one of the greatest athletes of all time. He knows where the try line is. 33 years of age, but still going strong, as good as ever, David Campisi. Sevens, a four-day party and celebration of just about anything. And there's the rugby, seven-man rugby. Wants to go away himself. It's been called the Mardi Gras on grass, an occasion when rugby nuts from around the world congregate to have a great time and maybe watch some footy. Crowd involvement is unbelievable, with 40,000 patrons getting in on the act and a special entertainment on the big screen when there's no action on the paddock. In 1997, Hong Kong played host to the World Sevens Championship, the 11th time David Campesi would come to play. First try of the tournament then. Greatest ever players, David Campesi. Yeah, I mean the people love him here. You, I mean, you heard the cheer of the crowd when David Campesi's name is is read out. All the appearances that we've made throughout the week, they're there mainly to see the great David Campesi. It's all fun, and that's why we're here to enjoy it. Obviously, the tournament's very hard. Some of the young guys in the Australian team are actually finding that out now. But uh, at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's just a great experience. Back in 1983, Mark Eller and David Campesi showed the world how to play seven. Campesi, here he goes, he's through, they won't catch him. Campesi again, there's no stopping this man, and Australia goes further ahead. What do you say about David Campesi? And apart from those who support Australia in Hong Kong, Campo was in 1997 once again our best on the park. The game breaker who knew when to pounce. They had tremendous sort of vision and awareness and, and just uh, the skills to, to use his lack of out and out speed to, to score many tries. Campesi. I think he's a legend. Uh, what I know of him is uh, he's a good guy, he's, a, he's an excellent player. And he's a, he's a good, uh, uh, how can I say, he's, he's a good sportsman, for, especially for the younger kids. 11 years of speed and swerve saw the crowd show their appreciation to Campo as he bid farewell to the Sevens in Hong Kong. Campo's rugby world. Now... 
what it does, it opens up the shop, a jersey from my hundred tests, a little miniature jersey, a leather bound book, and the book. And when David Campesi had retired from international rugby, his life moved into a new era, managing sports champions. From car racers to swimmers, David has established a management company popular with the corporate sector. Well, it's open doors, let's put it that way. I, I drop his name and I talk to companies and I get through <laughs> to people. We're trying to approach, say, five or six young Australians um, who we think are, are very promising and will go a long way. We just want to try and get their profile out there and get, um, because of my experience over 15 years, my contacts, um, and also my exposure overseas in England and South Africa and New Zealand. David is also now commentating on the game he loved to play. Aptly, the program is called The Running Game. Welcome back to The Running Game, or is it the David Camp Peasy Show? <laughs> well, Campo, they really turned it on for you last weekend. I can give my views, or you know, a lot of people actually know me as uh, I've got a big mouth and talking about rugby, but now it's talking about the game that I love, and you go into it a bit more deeper, you know, where problems are going, where the, the lines are running and things, and trying to understand or tell the people what, this, what we're trying to do on the rugby field. Well, David Campese's name will open doors that no other doors will open. I would like to see the Australian Rugby Union offer David Campese a gold American Express card. Card blanche, David, wherever you like, go out and promote the game. I'm sure that we would have a whole lot more people being involved in rugby just by being in touch with the David Campese character and the personality of the man. It is all rugby. It is something that, you know, if you wanted to manufacture the perfect marketing tool, he manufactured David Campuzzi. Let's hope the Australian Rugby Union doesn't let him go. In 1997, at the Australian Institute of Sport, David Campuzzi was invested as the country's first living legend. Not bad for a country boy who went on to represent Australia with such distinction. You know, I, I play the game because I love the game. I don't play the game for rewards or, or nights like this. And it's, um, you know, I'm very honoured, especially for my family. The AIS is known for the Olympics, it's known for swimming, athletics, runners, you know, Robert D. Costello and all these guys, the women's hockey, hockey in general. And for rugby to sort of be the first, I mean, it's, for me, it's great for the sport. And at this dinner, a song entitled The Day I Saw Campo Play. Never run the ball as Campo can, set the ground alight. These memories will stay with me like they were yesterday. I'll tell my grandson with some pride that I saw Campbell play. These memories will stay with me like they were yesterday. I'll tell my grandson with some pride that I saw Campbell play. Run, Campbell, run. Run, Campbell, run. I remember in uh, 95, I think it was, I think it was 95, and, uh, at the Sydney uh, Football Stadium, um, and when he came on as, as reserve, and, uh, and it was, obviously he had never, never been reserve, I don't think, before in a test match, and he came on and he actually tackled, actually tackled somebody, I couldn't believe it, he actually tackled Jonah. And, um, he sort of got up and we both sort of looked at each other just with one of those moments of like astonishment and he was sort of like, oh, that was an amazing one, you know. And then um, sort of towards the end of the game, he went to tackle with him again and Jonah fended him off. And, uh... I remember saying to Camper after the game, I said, oh, great tackle, you know, on, on Jonah. He said, he said, yes, I should have, I should have gone off then. <laughs> That's it! We had 65,000 South Africans here today, tremendous support. David, we didn't have 60,000 South Africans, we had 43 million South Africans. What do you say about the man? He's, he's, he's really a legend. What he's brought to the game is something you can't, you can't put a claim to, you can't really go and try and estimate what David Campisi did for rugby. It's something fantastic and it's been a privilege to play within one or two games and definitely against him and, and, and watching him play from when I was still at school 
and just seeing him play these days, he just puts everything in. He's a true professional, and I think that sums him up. Uh, he's, he's good and constantly so. And if I want a definition of a true professional, I say if a guy's good and constantly so, that's David Campisi. Yeah, that's another good moment, actually. I think it was about 80, uh, 88, I think, in, uh, at Ballymore, and I stepped Campo, actually. I've actually got a photo upstairs of it. <laughs> I'm meaning to send it over to you, Campo. Uh... Back in 1987, New Zealand won the World Cup. They now have the Gladysloe Cup for 12 months, at least. I think it's just the excitement he's brought to, to so many people around the world. Um, just the sheer brilliance on the field. And um, yeah, we, we think about that a lot as All Blacks, the, the enjoyment that we bring to, to everyone in the world in terms of, of the way we play the game. And uh, I think Michael Jones summed it up pretty, pretty well the other day when he said to the guys, you know, you never take it for granted being an All Black. And he said, when, you, when you're driving to the game today, have a look out the window and, and look at the expressions on the people's faces on the way to the game and what they think of you as All Blacks. And I'm sure a lot of people have done the same about Camper. In 1996, David Campesi embarked on his final tour with the Wallabies. First stop was Padova, Italy, to play his 100th test match. A tremendous achievement, and his former coach at Milan, Sandro Manzoni, was there to congratulate the great man. 64 test tries and 315 points. I think the, the journalists and the press and everybody was sort of talking about the game. I just wanted to play the game. Everyone was more excited about the game than me because I just wanted, to me, it was an opportunity to play for my country again. And that's what I was looking forward to doing. I was alone for a few, few years and uh, alone is not very, very nice. And uh, I, I, thank, you, thank you, David, to, to come to the 100 Caps uh, party because uh, I was too, too much alone and I, I spoke in myself. It was very difficult. Now I have a partner. It's much better. Campo's next test on tour was against Wales at Cardiff Arms Park. His final appearance in a test match. 101 test appearances. And viewers could experience the magic of David as he got the Wallabies back on track. The most experienced man on the field. Full time and Australia win. But Australia, in David Campisi's last test match, have emerged... And the Wallabies have shown this afternoon that they do know how to win now in the tight situations. The composer, Ma Simon Point of it was... Campo embraces Jonathan Davis and the crowd rises one to applaud this great champion. David Jonathan Davis, they're enjoying each other's company. And Simon, now the crowd is standing and applauding. They're applauding one man here. His name is David Campisi. And he's applauding back. Jonathan Humphrey salutes the 34-year-old. What a grand moment for Campo. What an historic moment in Australian sport. It's David Campisi. 101 test matches. He says this is his last. Let's hope not. It, w it was probably uh, important for me to to obviously play play a test and and go out of international rugby in a place like Wales where I've had so many great uh, experiences and so many great players have played there and I've played with them and on such a great ground. And I, I was very fortunate to, um, to play well there in 88 and get a stand ovation for Australians and Barbarians. And obviously again to, um, you know, because rugby, they're passionate about their rugby. They love rugby and they love watching great players and I was fortunate enough I had a, the opportunity to play them. Campo's final international tour had one more game, his favourite against the Barbarians at Twickenham. Another opportunity to say farewell to his fans, but not before one last try. Two metres out, Burke arrives. Can they swing it wide? Let it go. Capizzi. Yes! tries in the last 19 months, but of his 64 test tries and tries in big international games, that is one he'll savour, and so will the crowd. The final whistle sounds and David Campese's international career comes to a close with a lap of honour of the ground where he and Australia won the World Cup back in 1991.
So what is David Campesi's legacy to the game of rugby? He was a dominant figure in world sport. When Campesi got the football, people got to their feet. They expected something. When Campesi was playing, people came to the ground. Well, there's only one Campo every 100 years or 90 years or so on. You know, he's just a player, not of, of a lifetime, but of about four lifetimes in my view. He just wanted to run with the ball. He didn't want the ball to die. And he never gave up. We could have been 15, 20 points behind in the test match or, or any match, even for Ramwick. And he always thought that whilst we've got the ball, whilst there's time on the clock, we've got hope. And he always attacked. You know, I, I have a lot of emotion for David Campisi because I think he's one of the greatest players to grace, grace, uh, grace the game. As Nicky Boy, Nick Farr Jones said after the World Cup, without him we wouldn't have won the World Cup. Australia would not have won the World Championship World Cup without Campo. But David Campisi has continued for years and years to produce and every time people write him off, he comes back. And every time you see him play, he plays for the love of the game. He just had very unusual talents and probably the most important talent was he, he, um, he backed himself all the time and he had the physical attributes to be able to capitalise on what was going on in his mind and that created a lot of sensational uh, football and um, you know, it was just marvellous to watch. He's certainly a great character Campo, he's so different, he's an individual and uh, the thing I love about him always, he's, he's been a risk taker so he loves the chance he's on, he uh, walks the tightrope and occasionally has a bit of a stumble, but uh, Campo is an entertainer, and uh, rugby needs entertainers, and hopefully he will provide inspiration and the way for some other youngsters coming through, because I don't really think we'll ever see another Campo. He was a one-off, a real special. For David, there is but one simple message. You know, there's dreams. You've got to have a dream. And I think the thing that we really need in rugby is heroes. We need heroes so the young kids can actually strive to be like their hero.